Welcome. Could you please introduce yourselves? I'll start with Courtney. You are focused on the screen right now. So tell us a little bit Great. about who you are and what you're doing at the Institute. Well, thanks, Andrew. Yeah, I'm Courtney. I am in the fourth and final semester of my master's program at the Middlebury Institute, um, getting my master's in international policy and development. But as Caitlin and I like to say, and are potentially <laughs> starting our own little, coining our own little term here, we are focusing on counterterrorism, or at least my interest is in counterterrorism. And so personally, um, I found a nice little sweet nexus spot in policy and development and, uh, and domestic countering terrorism, as it were. And uh, the Middlebury Institute's a really nice place to be to meld those, those things together, so to speak. Uh, and so I've, I've uh, been fortunate enough to have some opportunities for experiential learning, which I think we're gonna talk about a lot today with the Inventive Rent competition and diverting hate. And uh, it's been a good opportunity thus far to uh, hone in on those interests. Uh, Caitlin? Sure, yeah. Um, so I'm in my third semester here at Middlebury Institute in the International Policy and Development Program as well. Um, I'm also a graduate research assistant at CTEC, which is the Center on Extremism, Terrorism, and Counterterrorism. Um, and I decided to go to Middlebury to help write policy within technology. Um, Courtney and I are both very passionate about how technology is influencing our lives and our culture and our society right now. Um, so this project was a really great way to put some ideas to the test and work with our fellow classmates on what solutions could, could look like. So Invent to Prevent, which is the thing that we're going to be talking a bit about today, there were many finalists, but the Middlebury team came out to be the number one finalist. I don't like to use the term winner, but you were recognized for your efforts above some of those other people that got recognized at that same level. What was it like to bring home the trophy? Well, they're going to ship it to us soon, I guess. <laughs> oh, there is a trophy. <laughs> yeah, there's a physical trophy. Something, I think yeah. we're going to let Jason keep it. Oh, like he needs more awards on his wall, but that's very that's very generous of you. So I'll I'll describe a little bit of how my understanding of in invent to prevent contest um, competition was, and then uh, diverting hate, which is the project that you did, which was um, recognized as uh, the top tier of these of these ways to use um, digital communities and digital community buildings uh, uh, tools to help. Reduce, combat, mitigate, I'm not even quite sure of the right word, um, online radicalization. That's what diverting hate is all about. Is that correct? Is that what the website is there to do? Uh, Caitlin, you're first because you're right there focused on the screen. Sure, yes, in, in such a way. So we first honed in on a form of extremism that we were all feeling very passionate about. Um, and research has shown us that misogyny is actually a gateway to other form of other forms of extremism. Um, so from there we narrowed it more down into incel ideology and from there narrowed it down into where are they where are they showing up where where are people who have this type of ideology showing up on the internet and how can we divert them away from those narratives into healthy more resilient building options. So the first piece was kind of um, a user design exercise within Twitter, where we'd actually keep the user within Twitter, and when a tweet would show up on their feed that's potentially dangerous or would lead to very dangerous misogynistic ideologies, um, we would give them the option to explore other things like healthy male influencers, community groups, or mental health tools. Um, to prove that out, since we don't work at Twitter and can't necessarily implement it ourselves, uh, we created this resource hub. And then we used our very small budget to run ads against key terms that we were able to find through um, a database that we built ourselves, as well as a network analysis that we created of the audience um, that we worked in conjunction with the Meta Lab here at Middlebury Institute on um, to target them with advertisements towards either healthy male influencers, community groups, and mental health tools. Again, kind of all grounded in research we've done about 
what creates resiliency. Um, and then use those ads to direct them to our resource hub, which right now is divertinghate.org. Um, we see that kind of blossoming into maybe its own different sort of brand. Um, and we, we saw some interesting click-through rates, especially given that this, this group doesn't normally click on things that are necessarily good for them or um, resilience building. So we're hoping to use that momentum to continue to learn about this audience and build more content that maybe they would engage with instead. Courtney, as we're here having this conversation, I'll bring you into the focus. This is such a disturbing thing to talk about. The work that you're doing and the research that you did must have been, in some ways, unbelievable. What surprised you, in some ways, the most, if you can even say the most, about some of the work that you did to, to work along this program and to, to find ways to connect with these young people who maybe need diverting? Sure. Um, well, Caitlin, as Caitlin said, um, this is something that the two of us are very passionate about, but also our team. And I will bring them into the fold here. There were 13 of us that did participate in this in the in the fall and five of us that presented two two weeks ago now. Um, so the 13 of us were really passionate about early prevention um, and not so much playing a whack-a-mole game when we found the problem and and identifying the problem and trying to find a way to identify the problem and sort of hit it on the head and and you know whack-a-mole um, the issue the broad issue of domestic terrorism or countering terrorism away um, and so this is something that has been born out of for some of us some from some very personal and experience with with radicalization. Um, and from others, just just being passive um, observers of what's happening. And I think one thing that we all gathered from this exercise and what we are really harping on taking forward is the importance of an empathetic approach, right? At the end of the day, these are people. Um, and it's not so much that, you know, they've been observing um, you know, the common rhetoric of Fox News or right-wing media and that they're just sort of becoming these radicalized groups. This is things that have been slowly happening over time um, through what we identified as, as a lot of it being a lack of mental health resources or a lack of um, access to mental health resources. And so, you know, these are people that need empathetic intervention early on before they're spiraling down this rabbit hole. Uh, and that's something that we're very passionate about. And I think that that approach, this sort of approaching radicalization through a mental health lens is something that we weren't anticipating uh, approaching the issue through in the beginning, but is something that we found through our research to be um, the avenue that we wanted to take. It is but one avenue and it's one that we pursued. And um, I think personally that that surprised me is being able to have, I think the, the capacity for that empathy, but it is very important for sure. Caitlin, we talked a little bit about the, the techniques of what you did. You did research on Twitter, you find out some stuff on there, then you develop this website. Um, is it working? Can How do you know if it's working? Um, is it working? Well, we ran one test, and from that one test, it is within like the industry average of a click-through rate to drive people to the site. So that's indicating to us that there is potential for this to work more. Um, the tactics we took to build that content and to design the site were around the research really grounded in, okay, while taking an empathetic approach, how do we build resiliency among this group? Um, and so that's why we decided to collect a grouping of community groups that are all all centered on men's health, as well as collect um, options around telemental health. That's something that's really taken off, especially during the pandemic. So when the user lands on that site, there's there are options. Um, so when the when we're directing them to the hub, they can explore what might be best for them. Um, we think that is a better approach because it gives 
them more auto autonomy in their decision making. Um, they've landed there already. They're curious. So to be able to personal, like, make it more personal to them and understand, okay, what am I really looking for? Um, we think will will be a way of continuing to engage them in this healthier conversation and away from these hateful and negative rabbit holes that they're falling into. Caitlin and Courtney, um, do you both identify as as females? Do you use she, her pronouns in your lives? Was it yeah, was it difficult you. for you to sort of empathize with these young men who are so at, at risk? Were, were there things you just didn't understand and couldn't comprehend about their thought process? I'll start with Caitlin because you're focused, or and then Courtney. Was was it hard to get your mindset to where they are coming from? Honestly, no, not at all. Um, incel ideology stands for involuntary celibate, which means they feel as though they've been rejected by women as a whole. Um, and it's really more grounded in, in depression and lack of self-confidence, um, which I think is something that any, any of us can feel at some point in our lives. Um, I think other influences of technology really play into that as well, especially dating app culture, um, I think can really make someone feel rejected um, when you're continuing to put yourself out there. I think this pandemic has made people feel even more isolated without being able to make connections. So I don't think it's necessarily far-fetched that these young men find themselves in these these headspaces and these narratives. Um, and I think it's even less far-fetched when they're engaging with them on social media that will only drive them further into it the more they engage. That's how it's designed. It's, it's designed to keep them in there. Um, so I don't, I don't blame them and I definitely hold empathy for anyone struggling with um, any kind of mental illness or mental health issue. Um, so I, I found it very interesting and I think the more we learned about it, the more I think we were able to kind of understand where we could meet them where they were. Courtney, were there would, days? Yeah, would, go ahead, Courtney. Yeah. No, I would just say I would, I would, I would echo that that completely. It's not as if you know these are buzzword echoing sort of terrified zealots that we are unable to empathize or um, understand where they're coming from. These are all feelings that a lot of us share, and um, you know, I myself have personal experience with my own family members that have kind of been down this path of radicalization, and so it's it's. All too common, unfortunately, and um, yeah, it's been a really good exercise. And yeah, so let's all step back from some of this deeper things to think about. Just ask about the day of the competition. How did you present it? What was it like on the day, uh, Courtney? You're you're still focused there. So, well, how did you present this to the judges? Um. Yeah. So I'll just kind of start broad and then narrow in. So there was, there was three final teams. Um, and so we went second and there was a lot of preparation. Um, I, I really admire and we would not be here without, without all 13 of our team and without uh, Jason Blazakis and uh, with the five of us that presented, but um, so we were given 15 minutes. We spent weeks preparing a 15 minute video uh, and Caitlin and I really had to uh, dip our toes into the world of video editing and putting together a 15 minute video, which uh, was quite the exercise in our, in our skills. Um, but so we had 15 minutes to present our idea, which is, you know, as you know, much harder and easier said than done to condense everything that we were thinking into 15 minutes. Uh, and then we had about 10 minutes of question and answering. So it was a really quite quick process, but Throughout that video, uh, our challenge was to present our process and, and our challenges. And a lot of time was spent both in the fall semester and we wanted to give credence to it in our video, just how um, difficult it was to approach the problem, uh, radicalization, as we said, and countering domestic terrorism and, and what to do about that is quite a broad topic that DHS and adventures gave us uh, and we wanted to intentionally approach that in a way that was thoughtful and empathetic and um, did justice to the 
diversity of the problem. Uh, but I'll kind of let Caitlin jump in here and fill in. Um, yeah, so I mean, there are several steps leading up to that final presentation. We had to submit um, a 15 page paper explaining what it is we did. Again, massive props to everyone on our team. That was a collective effort pulling it all together. Um, and then from there, we were told we were at top three, which was an exciting day for us all as we had just started um, our, our winter break vacation. Um, and then being in, in the live setting, the five of us prepared for what kind of questions we were expecting to be asked. And we did some of our, our intel research on all of the judges to really understand their backgrounds and what they might be interested in. Um, and what we could answer that might spark their interest in working with us moving forward, um, which has been the best part of this whole experience is that we get to now tap into that network um, and continue working with some of the people involved in the competition. Um, and really, we just, you know, wanted to pump each other up and feel like confident. We had been working on this all semester, so we, we knew the story. Um, we just wanted to make sure everyone had a chance to speak, and we were answering the questions to the best of our ability. Did you have that feeling as you were getting closer to the day of the presentation that you were going to take this home? Like, this is, how could we not win? <laughs> no. Kayla <laughs> and I were messaging each other, actually, in all honesty, like, up until they um they announced it, I was like, "There's no way," because some of the other teams that presented, they just they had incredible ideas. Um, you know, like there's such a need for diversity of thought when it comes to problem solving or approaching radicalization in the domestic sphere. Um, and so you know, ours is definitely not the only answer or the only solution. And the other teams had had provided great, great uh, presentations. So really, it was it was great all around. Caitlin, did you did you know in your heart that you were going to win, or did you? Well, did you have I that bottle of sparkling presenting. wine in the refrigerator chilled, all ready to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was presenting here in the in this in the SeaTac offices, and Jason was watching in the other room. And he came in during the break, and he was like, "You guys have it." So he boosted my confidence a little bit more than um, than I than I was thinking myself, but. It wasn't really, it was never about winning um, for us. I think what we were really excited about with this competition was just to have the opportunity to explore this topic in a creative way um, and work with experts along the way. Um, the big reason why I'm here at grad school is to connect with experts in their fields. And throughout the entire semester, we were talking with people every week with really unique and interesting backgrounds that help to fuel this idea. Um, and by having the opportunity to share our idea in the competition, we're hoping to inspire more people to, to join us and help us build build it out into something more, something more tangible. I could, this, it's such an important and fascinating topic. I could talk all day about it, but I've just got one more question and I'll ask both, but I'll start uh, with Courtney and then um, back to Caitlin. Courtney, you mentioned in our conversation a little bit ago that you have some personal experience in your life with uh, radicalization within within the group of people that you know. You're not alone in that. Are there things, if someone was watching and they're fearful that someone in their family may be going down this path, what are some things they should look for, warning signs that they should look for, or also um, measures that they can take to maybe divert before they go too far down the path? I think that's a really interesting question. It's something that I am still trying to parse out for myself personally. I think, um, I think in hindsight, you know, of course, 2020, but I think in, in hindsight, the way that I have handled um, my own personal relationships with people that were, have been radicalized to varying degrees, um, some less, some more, if you can even put it on that sort of quantifiable spectrum like that, um, my initial instinct was to sort of shut the proverbial door and cut off communication because it was, it was, I think, too difficult. And there was just, it felt as if there was too many roadblocks and just, there was never going to be a sense of agreement. And so my initial reaction was to, for many years, just to kind of avoid those people and um, shut the door. And I think that 
what I've kind of come to realize in, in the last few years, but especially in the last few months is is really approaching it through empathy and I don't mean that just to sound quip because that's kind of what our the name of our game is I think genuinely approaching um that like these are all people that have different um they have different perspectives and different stories and outlooks and different way that they have come to be radicalized I suppose or come to have views that are different than your own or can be viewed as as radicalizing whether it be through mental health resources or lack of mental health or something um, education or socioeconomic or whatever it may be uh, and so I think just having conversations with people and genuinely trying to have empathetic conversations understanding people's perspective um, I think that there's a there is a lot of polarization that is happening and a lot of pulling to extremes and I think that at some point there needs to be kind of coming back to a middle and having conversations with people and I suppose that doesn't quite answer your question mostly because I'm still trying to figure that out and there are resources out there and that's something that Diverting Hate our hub wants to do is provide those resources um for both people that are at risk of being radicalized like the young men in cells that's our particular target audience, but also for their family members, their neighbors, their friends, their coworkers, whomever it may be. So that's definitely something where we see uh, diverting hate going moving forward is providing those resources on both ends. Um, but I think if I could just sort of sum it all up into one point, it would just be to have understanding that it is a lot more complicated than just becoming radicalized and a sort of zealot because of media or some sort of innate hate. Um, it's often a lot more complicated and nuanced than that. Caitlin, I'm assuming that you agree and align with that thing. So are there resources that you come across that you would recommend for that people explore? And like telemental health is really becoming a space that is becoming more accessible and affordable. Um, things like BetterHelp, Cerebral, there's all sorts of um, applications like that where you can get matched with a talk therapist today. Um, and you can do it virtually, you can, you can text. Um, so I, I, I always am a huge champion of talk therapy. Um, I would also recommend when, when looking at your sources online, really being thoughtful about what you're reading um, and where is it coming from. And I think going back to what Courtney was saying about empathy, in today's world, we're inundated with information. And when it's the same kind of information all the time, you, you believe it. Um, and so helping people get the right tools to understand how to think critically about what they're receiving and um and that goes for for all forms of media you know the mainstream as well and really and making the decision for themselves like what what do i believe in this where is it coming from and why why should i do something with this information um and then taking a break like get off of it that's my favorite thing in the world <laughs> <laughs> don't look at the screen for a day or an afternoon Take a break. My last question for you both, and I'll start with you, Caitlin, and then over to Courtney, is has your time at the Institute filled you with hope for the future or made you anxious about the future? <laughs> a tornado of both, I'm <laughs> sure. Um, because we're surrounded by critical thinkers who care very deeply. This Institute is full of humanitarians. We're all here because we want to create a better world and we want to do it in a big way. It's why we study policy. Um, so that makes me super hopeful that I just meet all these amazing people with outstanding backgrounds who have aspirations in, in making the world a better place. Um, from you know my friends who are working really hard to save whale sharks to my friends who are working in non-proliferation. Um, it's really an inspirational place, but anxiety creeps up every day. Um, I'm sure everyone's feeling it this week even more so um, with what's going on in the world. So 
Yeah, it's a little bit of both. I think anxiety has to fuel um, some of that hope and some of that drive to do more. Um, but I, I, I have really enjoyed my time at the Institute. I think it's a really inspiring place to be. Yeah, I think that's 100% spot on. I would say I, I have come to view friction and tension and points of conflict not as something negative or something to sort of um, shy away from throughout my time at Ms. but I have come to see them as, as moments of opportunity, of, of immense opportunity um, to grow and to move forward and to meld things together that previously would not have come together. Um, I did go to Middlebury College and I studied philosophy and political science, which are about as theoretical of a, of a thing to study as anything else. And so I've really, really enjoyed coming to Ms. and um, learning very hard skills and very experiential learning. Um, and I think that that's the, the great strength of the, the Middlebury-Middlebury Institute partnership uh, and, and having the benefit of, of going to both.